This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Week four is coming in hot, and this is going to be a fantastic sports weekend, not just in the NFL, but the playoff races are spicy in baseball. We're talking strikeout props with Pitching Ninja later on. We've got NASCAR and Talladega, which I may be the only person excited for, but I don't care. I'm pumped for that. And then also a lot of fun games across week four in the NFL. We're going to break down all that here today on Covering the Spread, starting things off by talking to J.J. Zacharyson and getting you ready to bet some player props in week number four. This is Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research, joined here as I am every Friday by J.J. Zacharyson. Check him out on Twitter at Late Round QB. Find his work at LateRound.com and check out the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast. J.J., we are on to week number four. Pretty thrilled about this one how you doing today i'm good i'm tired uh you know after after a lot of debating about jameer gibbs last night on yeah. on x uh yeah man uh i'm doing good though i got a lot of david montgomery in fantasy so i i could be definitely worse does your life feel enriched after spending time arguing people on x last night yeah it was really you know there's there are times where uh you know you got to pick and choose your battles sure. uh these days on there and that was just a battle that i decided to, to go in I like I like the ones where you pick the battle because you're bored. Like I think those are fine. It's that was like, that's that's usually yeah. me during an island game, right? You're just right. hanging out on the couch like Thursday night. I don't have anything to do the next day right. from the perspective of like Sunday to Monday, you know, where things are a little bit crazier. It was and a three so, score yeah. game in the first half, you know, that that contributes right, to right. There's just the, the game wasn't very competitive, and I'm just like, sure, you know, I'm just crossing my fingers that Christian Watson scores a touchdown. And that's sure. really all I care about at that point. And then he ended up scoring. So overall for me, very entertaining night. And uh, I think the issue was uh, my guy, Jared golf was too efficient, you know, pedal it yeah. back a bit, Jared, let other, let other boys play in the, 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 the sandbox a little bit. Um, just, you know, scale yeah. it back. Let's not go too crazy here. So we're going to talk about week four player props with the JJ focusing specifically on the Dolphins Bills game to start and then talking about other player props. He likes this week again, later on talking to Rob Friedman, talking strikeout props, and I'll talk NASCAR later on. But first a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast these shows also do go up on the FanDuel YouTube page and over on FanDuel TV plus to watch FanDuel TV plus go to FanDuel.com slash watch and log in with your FanDuel account you can watch up and Adams live over there you can also check out covering the spread the solo shot for the final day today and then also uh, the heat check fantasy podcast uh, with myself and Brandon Gadula every Monday and Thursday Let's dig in now to week number four, JJ, and typically we don't spend an entire segment discussing one game, but I think looking at week number four, it makes a lot of sense to dive in deep on the Dolphins and the Bills. Now, this is going to be a thriller, and I like it from a traditional betting perspective, but for player props, like it's kind of a bonanza as well with so many fun guys, so many fun storylines with the Dolphins backfield and stuff like that. So looking at this game, any value you see for the Bills and Dolphins this week? Yeah, so I kind of approach this just from the perspective of like what could go down in this game and where, where are the matchups? Like, what does it look like for Miami? What does it look like for Buffalo? I think my biggest concern for Miami is that Buffalo has been really good at getting to the quarterback this year. They're second in pressure rate. They're second in sack rate. That's resulted in them being the third best team in EPA per drop back allowed. And when you look at the Dolphins, they face the Chargers, Patriots, and Broncos to start the season. Two of those games, they played unbelievable offensively. Obviously, last week, they could have easily broken the single game record for most points scored. Week one against the Chargers, it was a back and forth game. They scored a lot of points. Week two, though, against New England, they didn't necessarily get it done you know, offensively to the same degree, I should say, right? Well, when you look at it, the Chargers, 22nd in pressure rate, Denver, 30th in pressure rate, New England, 6th in pressure rate. So you're looking at an, or an offense that, you know, this is generally how it goes. You know, if teams are good at getting to the quarterback, they're going to be a little bit better defensively. So I wouldn't be surprised as a result if we see lower passing totals for Miami in this game than expected. Um, you know, at the very least, I think that what we could see because obviously Mike McDaniel is a very smart head coach. Uh, what we could see is e an even quicker release from Tua and maybe higher reception totals for a Waddle, for a Tyreek, and then maybe not have that match their typical yards per target, their typical yards per receptions uh, you know, that, that we see. So 
that's sort of my my general feel about the way that that Miami offense might go. Um, and then you know if you look at the opposite side, Miami has actually been pretty mediocre against the run this year, mm-hmm. and so I'm more inclined to bet overs on some of the running back props. I wouldn't go with like a James Cook anytime touchdown, for instance, because he hasn't been seeing seeing the goal line work in that offense. But I do think that a Josh Allen anytime touchdown on the ground, uh, you know, a, a Latavius Murray as a long shot, uh, anytime touchdown in a, in a decent game environment where he's led that team in goal line rushes to start the year. I think going that route makes sense. Um, and then, you know, obviously, just just given this, I wouldn't be surprised if we see an under hit even though I, you know, even though I, I think there's going to be a decent amount of points scored, right. that's really my forte more so player props is, but um, that's just generally the way that I see this game unfolding. So you could kind of take your bets based on some of those matchups. Latavius Murray is plus 240 to score this week. And like you said, he kind of dominates the backfield touches in close uh, Josh Allen, even money James cook uh, plus one Oh five. His red zone role was better last week, but better for him was a 33% red zone share, yeah. which is still below average for a running back. So even in a, a potential high scoring game, Plus 105, not enough to entice me. Now, like the rushing plus receiving for James Cook is a different discussion because getting a lot of work in the passing game, he's at 79 and a half there. I think that's awesome. Like, I think that's very attractive. But I want to pick your brain. Uh, We don't see props up for uh, Devon Achan yet, uh, but Raheem Mostert is up. What's your general read on that backfield? What do you think we're going to see for week four, specifically before Jeff Wilson gets back in the fold later on? Yeah, look, you know, I, I don't know if Savan Ahmed's gonna gonna be active or not, mm-hmm. but I, I don't think that Ahmed is really a threat at this point anymore mm-hmm. to Devon Achan and and what uh, he can do in that offense and what we saw this past week. You know, I, I've talked to a lot of fantasy managers over the last week. You know, getting questions and such about that backfield, and people are concerned about it being a committee. And yes, the answer is that it will be a committee in some way, shape, or form. That's basically every single backfield across the NFL, right? To right. me. I think Devon Achan is sort of the staple of that committee. Like I, mm-hmm. I wouldn't be, I mean, he was getting a lot of work early in that game yeah. before the game got out of hand. He was still seeing just as many, if not more touches than Raheem Mostert. So, um, you know, if you can see, if you can find some value, you know, if, if books are boosting Mostert a lot more than, than Achan, I would probably go in on the, on the Achan side there, just because I think it's going to be more of a 50, 50 split after what we saw last week. Yeah, Achan's first half snap rate was 48%. He was on the field with Mostert a lot, and that might decrease with Waddle being back, but like they were actively getting him involved, which I think is a yeah. good signal for him going forward. Okay, let's uh, broaden things out here and talk about other situations to monitor here. Fluid situations, we could see some value for week number four. I think the Dolphins one is the biggest one in my mind, but outside of that, JJ, which other situations are you monitoring entering week number four? Yeah, you know, it's, it's tough to really act on this one because the Jets offense has been so uh, putrid. But uh, Brees Hall did take a step forward this past week in, in snap share, which is good to see because, you know, he's just very clearly the best running back in that backfield. Uh, but last week he played 48% of, of New York's offensive snaps. That was significantly higher than, than Dalvin Cook and Michael Carter. And I know that sounds crazy that it wasn't higher already, but in week three, uh, or sorry, in week two, it was basically even across the board. Uh, among those guys it was like 15 snaps 16 snaps 16 snaps between those three so you know I do think a a negative game script this week could mean a little bit more Michael Carter than we would like Um, but at the same time I think that the fact that their backs are up against the wall at this point um, you know the Jets they they need to be competitive they need to show something even if they don't get the win Um, and so I I do think that Brees Hall is at least getting more and more intriguing it's a situation to, to monitor for sure and then another situation to monitor, we saw a lot of quotes this week out of out of the Rams uh, uh, coaching group talking about Kyron Williams' workload. So Kyron Williams over the last two weeks has seen every single Rams running back rush, every single one. We've had five games this year from running backs where they had a 100% running back rush there. Kyron Williams owns two of those five games. Now, the issue, so they came out and they said, maybe we should not give Kyron Williams this much work, which is totally understandable. The issue I have is that they don't have very intriguing backups. Ronnie Rivers, an 11th percentile prospect in my prospect model. Zach Evans, not much better. He's like 36th percentile. Um, And so I'm not sure that there's that much reliability outside of Kyron Williams. But again, this is something to at least monitor and understand that they might not be giving Kyron Williams. He's still going to see, you know, bell cow usage more than likely, but they might not give him the same type of usage that we've seen over the last couple of weeks. And then I think the last one to monitor 
uh, and to look at is Mike Williams and his injury. So, mm-hmm. you know, we talked about this before, but when uh, a wide receiver gets hurt, you have to look at the guys who were third and fourth on that depth chart, because obviously the guy who's third on that depth chart is now going to be on the field in two wide receiver sets. The guy who's fourth on the depth chart will be on the field in 11 personnel or three wide receiver sets. So Josh Palmer will be the number two, at least to start. Quentin Johnson, their rookie, is now going to be on the field a lot more uh, in 11 personnel. The Chargers have run the 13th most 11 personnel to start the season. And so, you know, I think QJ, Quentin Johnston, sees a naturally bigger bump based on where he was at. Uh, but Josh Palmer, you know, he's a, he's another intriguing option. He's a solid enough wide receiver uh, where he's now going to be on the field in a very pass-heavy offense, pass-friendly offense in these two wide receiver sets in a good matchup. So just keep in mind that, uh, you know, those guys are going to get a lot, a lot more run now that Mike Williams is out. The thing I like about Palmer, too, is that we've seen him step up when they've had Keenan Allen, like when he's not the one. Like when Josh Palmer is yeah. the one, it's not going to go great. But if Keenan yeah. Allen's there to get attention, uh, Palmer's played decently well in the situation. And this year, his yard for route run is terrible, but his dot is high. Uh, Justin Herbert's chucking it a bit more this year. Palmer's benefiting. So although the yardage has not been there thus far, I think that the potential for yardage is there for Josh Palmer. And I think that is a building block I would want when looking at Josh Palmer props. Okay, let's dig in now to some yardage props over at FanDuel Sportsbook. JJ, where are you seeing value for week four in that department? Yeah, so I'm going to start off with uh, Russell Wilson, and I'm going to actually take the under 250 and a half passing yards against Chicago this week. Um, you know, it's clearly hard to go under because Chicago is is really, really bad defensively. Um, but the issue that I think that that Russ could run into with this game is that it's just not that much of a back and forth affair. You know, I know the the total is OK. It's around like 46. Um, but, you know, there's a, a very obvious chance that, you know, this the, the Bears offense doesn't get things going because they haven't gotten things going, you know, all season long. Now, Russ has hit 300 yards in back to back games. So I think that's why the line is set where it's set right now. Um, but their game against Washington, uh, that saw 68 points scored. And uh, in that game, Russell Wilson had a 50-yard Hail Mary at the end, which definitely skewed those results a decent bit. Um, and then obviously last week in their game, you know, against Miami, it was a super, super negative game script where they're going to throw the ball a lot because they're down by 150 points. So, uh, you know, now they get Chicago. Broncos are three and a half point road favorites. Uh, you know, the Bears, uh, because they haven't been very good this year, they've actually allowed the second lowest uh, pass rate in the league. So I think that we could just see a situation where it's a more ground and pound approach and a more methodical approach instead of Russell Wilson throwing the ball, you know, 40 plus times. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And the Hail Mary thing is important to note, like the game script in general is important to note because like context matters a lot with these numbers early on this year. Like we've seen a lot of Adam Thielen buzz this week and that makes sense. You know, he's had a good target share, but last week they threw 58 times in Mm -hmm. that game. And so it's important to keep in mind context when looking at these early season numbers with Russ, they've had these high scoring games. They've had the super negative script. They're hopefully not going to have a super negative script against the bears. So that context does matter a lot. What about touchdown? Uh, Any other uh, yardage props you like for this week, JJ? Yeah. Another yardage prop I like is Christian Kirk hitting his over Uh, right now. It's 52 and a half over on FanDuel. Kirk is really good against man defense. And Doug Peterson is actually, commented on this he commented this after uh, on this after week one talking about how christian kirk thrives uh in those man coverage environments but you can look at the data too last year his yards per route run against man was plus eight three plus 0.83 yards better um against man than against zone so he's, he's just a better man uh better wide receiver against man coverage than zone coverage and so far through three games he's had one blow up game Week one against Indianapolis, he had a 9.4% target share. Week two, it was a 34% target share. Week three, back down to 15%. Now, if you look at weeks one and three where he had lower target shares, uh, they featured games against teams that ranked 31st and 32nd in their rate of throwing man coverage out there. And then again, in week two, it was against Kansas City. They've been third in man coverage rate this year. So this this, uh, matchup this week against Atlanta, they're fourth in man coverage rate. Uh, I think that, you know, there's no Zay Jones more than likely in this matchup that could boost up his target share naturally a little bit as well. Uh, it's just a matchup game for Christian Kirk. And I think it's it's there for him this week. It definitely is. And in that game uh, in week two, they lined Kirk up in the backfield a lot. So they were actively trying to find ways to get him involved. And I think that was 
successful for them. And I think that uh, is encouraging for them heading into week number four as well. Let's shift our focus now talking about some touchdown props. JJ, where do you see value for week four there? Yeah, I got two of them for you. One normal one and one not so normal one as I do each week. Uh, the normal one, although it feels really weird saying this because I don't think that he's that amazing of a, of a running back, but I'm going to go Alexander Madison, who's at even money right now as an anytime touchdown. Um, you know, say what you want about his play, but he's coming off a game where he had an 87% running back rush share, 17% target share in that game. Minnesota has a decent implied team total. They're top 10 in the league this week with a 24 point implied team total or around 24 points. Um, Madison, Madison has seen all of their goal line work this year and Carolina ranks bottom five in rushing yards over expected allowed per rush this season. And, and the other thing too, Minnesota has regression coming in the way that they're scoring touchdowns. Now their pass rates really, really high, but even when you factor in that pass rate, we should expect 83% of their touchdowns to come via the air, uh, based on their pass rate. But so far they've scored all of their touchdowns this year through the air. All nine of them have come from Kirk cousins. So uh, I do think we could see some regression uh, in the way that they're scoring touchdowns. The matchup is actually decent. And if, if Madison continues to get the work that he's seeing, you know, obviously it can go south because they might start using other running backs. But, um, you know, if he keeps seeing that workload, you know, he could find the end zone this week. My deeper play, though, get ready for this. Nelson Aguilar plus 450 as an anytime touchdown. This is over on DraftKings. But uh, I'm going Nelson Aguilar. You got Rashad Bateman and Odell Beckham. They didn't practice on Thursday. I don't know if they're going to go this week, and it doesn't sound good for them. That's going to obviously leave Zay Flowers as someone who's going to see probably like a 30% target share this week, you know, against Cleveland. But the Browns rank first in the league this year in percentage of targets funneled to the slot. And Aguilar has run the most routes from a percentage standpoint uh, out of the slot for Baltimore this year. Now, I do think there's a possibility that we see him more on the perimeter than usual because Rashad Bateman and Odell Beckham are injured. But even still, that means that he's going to be out there in two wide receiver sets. He's going to be out there a lot more frequently. You know, obviously this game might be a little bit ugly just in terms of the amount of points scored and such. Um, but I do think that at those odds, it's at least intriguing and at least kind of a fun bet. He's more involved than you would think slash hope. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you kind of got to do it. And that's where the odds lead you. I get it for sure. Uh, he's still kicking in 2023. That is JJ Zacharyson. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Late Round QB. Find his work over at LateRound.com and check out the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast as well. JJ, a pleasure to talk to you as always. Good luck to you in week four. We'll talk to you again next week. Thanks, Jim. Alrighty, again, find JJ on Twitter at Late Round QB to check out all of his work and make sure you check out the Late Round Fantasy Football Podcast, four podcasts per week over there on that feed. It is also a huge day across Major League Baseball, though. So let's bring in Rob Friedman, pitching ninja, to talk about this slate because, Rob, my goodness, I cannot remember a Friday, the final Friday of the regular season mattering as much as this one matters. So you got to be geeked about this weekend. Absolutely. I mean, it's kind of weird picking K props and everything now because yes. some guys are getting work in, other guys may go deep. And they're big games and they're not so big games. So you got to yep. figure it out, which is a fun challenge. It's a fun challenge. And it, it varies so much team to team. Like the twins right now are like three strikes and you're out for the pitchers. Like <laughs> you throw three strikes. Cool. See you get in the dugout. Rest up. We'll see you next week. But like it varies so much team by team. So like how much do you have to dig into like team philosophies, player incentive, stuff like that to kind of know where the traps may be for this week? absolutely a ton like yesterday i got burnt twice with yeah. sunny gray and zach wheeler i was hoping they'd go a little bit deeper i needed one more inning out of them basically to get my yeah. k's but uh they didn't and that's like i knew going in it was going to be tough so yeah you do have to make educated guesses right and figure out and some guys that are totally out of it they're going to let run so yeah you know you just don't know it just depends what matters yeah, um, I think the true twist for Sonny Gray would have been if Rocco Baldelli had been like, hey, we're going to have you go 110 this time because he's gone <laughs> yeah. like 90 the entire year. That would have been the plot twist is like actually letting Sonny Gray cook a bit uh, if they had done that instead. I mean, I would have been in for it. I needed a couple <laughs> Ks from him. That would have been nice. Like he looked good. We'll talk to Rocco, try to, yeah. to get him on the phone for that one. This is Rob Freeman. You can find him on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. Find his work on MLB, MLB on Fox, Peacock, and FanDuel Sportsbook as well. And Rob, let's dig in now to the strikeout props uh, that you like across Friday night. As you mentioned, 
a lot of stuff to juggle when you're looking at these for this week. So which strikeout props are you on tonight, considering all of those factors? So I'm doing a parlay. You know, I, I every day I've got to do it for the entire season. We're going to keep <laughs> going. I have Yusei Kikuchi, 6Ks or more. Uh, Carlos Rodon, 6Ks or more. And Kyle Hendricks, 4Ks or more. I mean, 4Ks, okay. come on. He could do that. What was the number for Rodon again? Six. Okay, so six plus for Kikuchi, Carlos Rodon for six plus, and what was the final one again? Um, Kyle Hendricks for four Ks or more. Oh, I, I think they all have something going for them. I usually would not pick Kyle Hendricks in a K prop, but uh, you know what? Four K is doable. He's done it a bunch, like consistently. He's four, five, six. Game that matters for him. Let's go. I don't know if you can find a game more important than this one yeah, for the Chicago Cubs. I got my Cubs hat on. I'm trying to manifest some playoff baseball just down the street from me. So we're trying to get some playoff baseball here in Chicago. Hendricks over three and a half is minus 104. And for a lot of these situations, you could expect them to take kind of like a a playoff mentality where they'd be okay yanking the starter early if they're not effective. But with Kyle Hendricks, I think the experience is there. He's been pretty effective still so far this year, despite not being a high strikeout guy. And the Brewers, they're coasting, man. Like, they're in the playoffs already. So I think you've got the right formula there with Hendricks. You still feel good about him, despite the fact he's not typically a big strikeout guy. Exactly. Like, I, I think four is doable, um, pretty, especially in a big game like this against a team that really, you know, they've, they're coasting. They just want to get it. And, and this means a lot to them. I don't know that, Getting keyed up matters to Kyle Hendricks. I actually think he's not going to be keyed up. He's yeah. kind of like that. That's the point. Yeah, exactly. But I think that, you know, again, against a team that's kind of just ch chilling. Yeah, I like it. If you look at the Brewers lineup the first day after they clinched, they're chilling. Like that yeah. was that was pretty obvious there. And I think honestly, Rob, we we should uh, hope they're doing the exact same thing for tonight. Let's go back to talk about Yusei Kikuchi, because once again, a lot of importance in this game. And Kikuchi is a guy we discussed a couple of times here on the show because he's been so much better from June on, effectively. Kikuchi to get five and a half strikeouts is plus 118. And Rob, I just like that number, plus 118 over five and a half for Kikuchi. I think that like you can have some issues, but like the plus 118 helps alleviate, at least for me, some of those issues. Yeah, absolutely. Go deep into the game. He'll rack up K's. I think it's, it's something like eight of his last nine outings. He's had six K's or more big game for him. Um, and I think he wants to continue to finish strong. So I can see that number. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. Yeah, I agree with that one as well. Let's finish up here by talking about Carlos Rodon in that game. And I know the Yankees have been eliminated. They're not, you're, they're not involved, but this is a, a player motivation type thing, right, Rob? Where that is literally yeah. my mindset, hundred yeah. percent. Like I think Rodon, he's he's shown some signs of the old Rodon. He had a nine and ten K game pretty recently, and to just to finish strong, like it means a lot to him. He's a very prideful dude. He exactly. doesn't. He did not want to be out for the you know the season this year and and struggle. Um, I want to see him finish strong. I think he will finish strong. And I think six K's is doable against the Orioles. And I think from the Yankees perspective, you don't want to pedal him back for next year. You want to ramp him up because like you want to make sure it's not a huge jump in innings from 2023 to 2024. So like you kind of need him out there for as much as you can get in order to kind of build in that base from a forward looking perspective. It's not even just like the, the fact that Rodon wants this himself matters, but I think the Yankees also have an incentive to let Rodon stay out there a bit longer. Yeah. And, and I mean, show the fan base, what Rodon can be. Rodon wants to show the fan base, what he can be yeah. and to ramp him up. I think there's multiple reasons why he should do it, which means he probably won't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think we've got that. You've, you've nailed my logic on these picks. Uh, and Rob, here we go. Plus 690 on the, the three-leg parlay for Yusei Kikuchi to get six-plus strikeouts, Carlos Rodon, six-plus, and Kyle Hendricks, over three-and-a-half strikeouts as well. So it feels like it was destiny that this would be the parlay for today. <laughs> exactly. And those are pretty solid odds. Very nice. I, I do. They are very nice odds, indeed. Okay, so those are the three strikeout props Rob likes for today. Now, we have been getting a lot of the uh, strikeout leaderboards here recently, but I do want to talk about it, Rob, just in case we do wind up getting that leaderboard up for today. When you look at the pitchers on today's slate, and again, it's a weird dynamic because the, the motivations are so odd. 
Is there anyone you're kind of looking at as being a, a, a someone who could push to lead the night in strikeouts? It wouldn't surprise me to see Rodon do it. I think mm-hmm. he's he, um, Cease is another guy who's shown mm-hmm. some flashes of being Cease from last year. And again, it's another situation where I can see him wanting to finish strong. He's not happy with the year he's had and to, to just go out with some fireworks. He could he could do it. Um you know, and, and then looking at other guys, I see Ryan scares me. Yeah. Like he I, obviously can do it, but he's not going to throw enough innings to do it. Right. Like I think there's no chance. I think he goes four max. Like that's, that's my thing. That's my concern. I don't even know what is. I think you could like, like we don't do unders here, you know, but like, I think you look at under. Yeah. Joe Ryan I, I that totally number. agree with you. Like that was the way I was thinking. I think six is too much to ask for him. Um, yeah. He'll get pulled before that unless he's, I mean, you know, the, the best bet for the over is he has two innings where he K's aside or something like that, which he could do. He so could I do. guess that's Absolutely. not totally out of play. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, and then you have like, you know, Wu's got a big game in front of him. Yeah. It's been a little uneven, but he can mm-hmm. strike out a bunch of folks and uh, you know, he's somebody I would take a look at as well. And it seems like Wu has been like trying to tinker a lot again um, down the stretch here too, which makes sense. He's a young guy trying to find that groove. But like, I think the thing about him is once he finds that groove, he can't have spike games. That's what you need to lead the the day in strikeouts. You need spikes. You need upside. And Wu at least does have that very much in his wheelhouse. That That's what would excite me about him. Like when he's hot and he's electric, you know, he's going to get the, you know, the crowd feed, feeding off all that. He may be that guy who steps up today and has a big game, but it's this is like this is a fun one to pick for a K yeah. leader because literally no idea of who's going right. to go. Deep. But I think that your parlay, you've got you've taken like the proper like steps to ensure like okay, player motivation, team motivation, et cetera, et cetera. So you say Kikuchi six plus strikeouts, Carlos Rodon six plus, Kyle Hendricks four plus, and as we speak right now, that parlay is plus six ninety over at FanDuel Sportsbook. That is Rob Friedman. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. Find his work on MLB, MLB on Fox, Peacock, and of course right here at FanDuel Sportsbook as well. Rob, enjoy all the baseball this weekend. It's going to be unparalleled and how fun it'll be. And we'll talk to you again in the very near future. Absolutely. Take care. You as well. That is again, Rob Freeman. Find him on Twitter at Pitching Ninja to see all the delightful gifts that we get from tonight's games. We're going to dive into some NASCAR and Talladega here in just one second to close out this week. But first, snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There is a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, totals, and more. So visit FanDuel.com and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Must be 21 plus in president select states, including now Kentucky. Welcome Kentucky to the fold. FanDuel, uh, official partner of the NFL. Uh, FanDuel is offering sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued as non withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit FanDuel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat in Connecticut, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-522-4700. Visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland. 1-800-GAMBLER.NET in West Virginia. 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts or call 1-877-8-HOPE-NY or text hope and y in New York. Let's finish up for this week by talking about some NASCAR because they are in Talladega and not a lot of tracks much more thrilling than that. And this is the second race in the round of 12 for the NASCAR Cup Series playoffs. So motivation is very high across the board for this week. And it's a lot of chaos. I don't think it'll be rested up because it's the playoff race. In fact, in Daytona, we kind of saw that ramp down a bit uh, because everyone's trying to race for some points, or at least a lot of the field is. So 
I think we might see a more tame race, both because of that and because Talladega is less chaotic than Daytona in general. It's a wider track. There's more room for error. But win odds are still super flat for me and at, at sports books. But it's better. I'm better able to justify betting a favorite at Talladega than I am in Daytona. And the one I like most this week is Joey Logano at 14 to 1. Logano is not in the playoffs, so there's always that risk he could decide to push his teammate Ryan Blaney to a win in Talladega. But We've never really seen Team Penske play nice. Uh, Logano and Brad Keselowski tangled uh, when they were teammates in Daytona a couple years ago. Blaney and Cindric tangled at uh, the Daytona 500 uh, last year. So, like, you know, Team Penske can undergo, undergo some shenanigans. And the, the, the possibility for Blaney and Logano to be 1-2 on the last lap does exist because I have Blaney as a favorite in my model, and Logano is number two. But the odds that that actually plays out like that are pretty low. Logano fantastic super speedway racer so that's why i'm okay kind of overlooking that one possibility logano got a win in atlanta this year he almost won daytona would have won it had the caution come out a little bit sooner um he is a three-time winner in talladega 10 percent win rate for his career in talladega and fords in general have been dominant on pack tracks this year i had a bet earlier on this week in the betting guide over on number fire for ford to win at plus 130 it's down to plus 110 i technically do show value there i've got 49 percent, so still some value but um prefer to go with logano individually with where things stand right now there so yeah logano could push blaney to a win i just don't think the odds that specific scenario happening are super super high so my model has Logano at 8.2% to win. His implied odds are 6.7%. That's a big enough gap for me to bite on Logano and plug him in at 14 to 1. Other outright is not on a guy you probably expected to hear about in a uh, betting recommendation section for a super speedway race. But that's actually Martin Truex Jr. at 25 to 1. He has infamously never won on a super speedway. And it's over a very large sample. So it may seem very odd. But he's not as bad of a pack racer as someone like Kyle Larson, and his odds are actually longer than Larson's. Larson is 20 to 1, whereas Truex is 25 to 1. I don't think that should be the case because Truex has a couple runner ups in Daytona, lost to Eric Jones by like a nose when they were teammates, uh, Joe Gibbs Racing back in the day at Daytona. And he also won stages in Daytona both last year and this year. So I think he can win and can run well on pack tracks. He just hasn't so far. Trex, though, does run up front. He's had a top 13 average running position eight times in 11 next-gen era pack races. So he runs up front, doesn't always finish there, but I think he has the ability to do so. And it's not like I'm saying that he will. I've, I've got him at 5% to win, which means there's a 95% chance that Truex does not win, but the implied odds of 25 to 1 are 3.8%. So my odds are better than than. Uh, the implied odds, and I agree with them that we're taking it a bit too far with downgrading Truex at a pack track. So I agree with the model here where Truex is undervalued at 25 to 1 to win this week. So the two Cup Series bets I like are Logano 14 to 1 to win and Truex 25 to 1. If you can get forward at 130 or longer, I would still take that. I think that'd be my favorite bet. But um, with where things stand right now at FanDuel, we'll go with Logano and Truex. We also do have the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series in Talladega for this week. And it's a similar setup where odds are super flat and I can't get to any of the favorites. My model has Christian Eckes as the favorite, but he's 10 to 1 to win at FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, applied odds of 9.1%. So I can't get there. I do see value in some longer shots, though. Uh, and I think that these are spots where I agree with what the model is saying. Those two longer shots are Matt Crafton, 30 to 1, and Tyler Ankrum at 40 to 1. And we'll talk about Ankrum in a second, but with Crafton, my model actually has him quite a bit of above his implied odds. He's 5.3% for me versus 3.2% implied. And he's had very good runs on pack tracks so far this year. Crafton led 29 laps in Atlanta, which is a semi pack track. It's racing more like a mile and a half recently, but still a pack track to me. He had a sixth place average running position in Daytona as well. He had a fifth place average running position in, in Talladega last year. Now he's never won like. Truex on this track type across 42 races between Daytona, Talladega, and New Atlanta. But I do think that he has the upside to do so based on the runs he has had both here recently and this year specifically on the pack track. So Matt Crafton, 30 to 1, a bet I do agree with as well. As for Ankrum, he actually has a teammate in this race, whereas he typically does not. His teammate is Jake Drew, and Jake Drew does not have experience on pack tracks, but 
For some reason, Jake Drew has the same win odds as Ankrum. Now, it's not a negative for Jake Drew. I'm just confused why Ankrum would be down here, given that he actually has shown some feistiness on tracks like this. I have Ankrum at 4.1% to win. His implied odds are 2.4%. He has had 10 career races on either Daytona, Talladega, or the new revamped Atlanta. He has had a top 14 average running position in nine of those 10 races. He has had a top 10 mark six times. This is the finishes, but a lot of it's due to very late crashes for Ankrum. He was 7th in Daytona this year. He was 10th in Talladega last year, 11th in Atlanta last year as well. I think he can definitely do it. Just needs to put a full race together. So Ankrum, 40-1, to 1, I just think he's pretty talented on this track type, and I think the odds don't encompass that. So uh, for Cup Series, I like Logano, 14-1, to 1, Truex, 25. And for the Truck Series, give me Crafton in 31 and Ankrum at 40-1. to 1. That is all that we have here for today and this week on Covering the Spread. Big thank you once again to our guests for today, JJ Zacharyson and Rob Freeman. Find JJ on Twitter at Late Round QB and find Rob on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow FanDuel Research at FanDuel Research. Have a fantastic weekend, everybody. Enjoy the playoff, effectively, baseball. Enjoy the NFL action. Enjoy Talladega if you're watching that too. We'll talk to you all once again next week. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.